Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. I'll start with the background, move to the crime, and then get to the mental health and personality factors. So looking at the background, we see that Pauline Parker was born on May 26, 1938, in Christchurch, New Zealand. Juliet Hume was born on October 28, 1938, in London. Pauline had an illness named osteomyelitis when she was five years old. Her treatments were painful. She was excused from physical activities at school due to chronic leg pain. She was described as artistically talented. She enjoyed sculpting with clay and writing. Juliet was hospitalized for tuberculosis when her family lived in England. Her family would move to New Zealand when Hume was 13 years old. Now, Pauline and Juliet would meet in 1953 when they both attended the same high school. The fact that they both had medical conditions was a similarity over which they could connect. Initially, their families were happy with the friendship, but over time, concerns started to develop. Their connection was quite strong. They were spending a lot of time together, excluding other relationships. They developed this fantasy world where they could live when they were together. They even wrote stories and plays based on the fantasy world they created. Juliet's mother said that Juliet would enter so completely into these characters, it was difficult to establish contact with Juliet. So the primary person kind of was lost in that. The fantasy person moved to the forefront. The girls developed names for themselves, Gina for Pauline and Deborah for Juliet, and they made plans for the future. They believed that they would be actresses someday in the United States. They were described as arrogant and conceited. They believed they were geniuses, and they found this special key that allowed them to see what they referred to as the fourth world. This was part of a religion they developed for themselves. The fourth world was like heaven. They believed they could glimpse into that fourth world twice a year, but when they died, they would go there full time. Their parents were worried that the two were romantically attracted to each other, which at that time would have been highly frowned upon, but their parents still allowed them to build their friendship. Juliet's parents brought her to a mental health professional at one point. He said that the two were probably having a homosexual relationship, but not to worry about it because they would probably grow out of it. Around that same time, the girls discovered that Juliet's mother was having an affair. In 1954, Juliet's parents decided to separate. The plan was for Juliet to leave New Zealand with her father and go to South Africa. The girls came up with this idea that Pauline could move with Juliet to South Africa. Both sets of parents were against this idea, but the girls became fixated on the idea that Pauline's mother specifically was an obstacle to this plan. In late April of 1954, Pauline and Juliet decided to kill Pauline's mother, although they didn't really develop their plan until June. After the murder, they were planning on flying to New York City or Hollywood, California. They thought if they could reach one of those destinations, they could publish the books they had written, and Hollywood would turn them into movies. So this takes us to June 22, 1954, of course, still in Christchurch, New Zealand. Now, it's important to understand that Pauline's mother was named Honora Riper, but she made it seem as though she was married to a man named Herbert Riper when she was not. So at the trial, she was referred to as Honora Parker. So Parker was walking in Victoria Park along with Pauline and Juliet. They were walking on a path that was surrounded by trees not far from a small wooden bridge. Pauline produced a stocking containing half of a brick and beat her mother to death with it. Not long before this, all three of them were at a nearby tea shop. The girls ran back to this location and told the owners that Pauline's mother had fallen and struck her head. When the police arrived, they noted that the injuries were inconsistent with a fall. Pauline's mother had 45 external injuries, 24 of which were to the face and scalp. The front of her skull was also fractured. The other bit of key evidence was Pauline's diary, which the police found that evening. 16-year-old Pauline Parker was arrested that same night. 
15-year-old Juliet Hume, would be arrested the next day. Pauline's diary contains some pretty incriminating entries. She wrote about the plan to murder her mother. She wrote, It's a definite plan we intend to carry out. We have worked it out carefully and are thrilled by the idea. Evidently, she learned to make these entries by reading the little-known book, Diary Writing for Future Felons. Additionally, she wrote, Naturally, we feel a trifle nervous, but the pleasure of anticipation is great. Later, she said that the murder they were planning felt like the night before Christmas, it was a happy event, and she felt as though she was planning a surprise party. I don't think homicidal surprise parties would ever catch on, mostly due to the murder part, but also some people really don't like surprises. Some people might look at something like that and say, pick between murder and surprise. We're not doing both, right? That's just taking things too far. The girls eventually confessed, therefore their trial was really about the issue of insanity. The two were convicted of murder on August 28, 1954. They would end up serving about five years. Pauline was released in 1959 and worked for a while in New Zealand before moving to England in 1965. She was given a new identity, Hilary Nathan. Juliet was released two weeks before Pauline. Juliet moved to Italy immediately. She would go by the name Anne Perry. In 1996, Pauline Parker released a statement through her sister in which she said she was sorry for killing her mother. She said it took five years for her to realize what she had done. Apparently, at the time she made these statements, she lived a fairly reclusive lifestyle. Juliet Hume became a writer. She's actually remarkably successful. She writes detective novels. She has sold over 20 million books. She's made several statements since her release. She has made the assertion that the relationship between she and Pauline was obsessive, but they were not romantically involved with one another. She participated in the murder because if she didn't, she was afraid that Pauline Parker would commit suicide. Her first three months in prison were in solitary confinement. It was there that she acknowledged she was guilty and prison was the right place for her. She was forced to do hard labor in prison for two weeks, but then she collapsed and was given a job sewing uniforms. And she said that prison was awful because there was no fruit and no library. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. There was never a definitive diagnosis established for either Pauline or Juliet, at least I'm not aware of one. The mental health professionals argued that the girls both had paranoia, narcissism, and attachment anxiety. The prosecution argued that the girls were not delusional. The defense said they were delusional. This is a common breakdown we see in these types of high-profile trials. Specifically, the defense tried to make the case that the girls had a condition called Foley Adu. I'll talk more about that condition in a few moments. In the end, the jury decided that the girls did know the difference between right and wrong. So with all that in mind, what could have been going on in a case like this? There are a few possibilities. They could have simply been narcissistic and psychopathic. They could have had Foley Adu, or they could simply have chosen to commit murder without any type of mental health issue being a factor. The girls exhibited coldness, arrogance, a lack of empathy, a lack of remorse, a sense of entitlement, a detachment from reality, and a tremendous investment in fantasy. Could Folia do explain these symptoms and explain why they committed homicide? Did the evidence point to some type of delusional state? So let's take a look at Folia do. This is also called shared psychotic disorder. This is an interesting construct. It's actually not technically a disorder in the DSM currently. Rather, it's an explanation of how delusions sometimes manifest, like a certain situation where they can occur. This construct has many names in addition to folia du and shared psychotic disorder. It's been called induced psychosis, psychosis by association, double insanity, communicated psychosis, simultaneous psychosis, and imposed psychosis. Folia du can involve many people, but it usually involves just two, the primary partner, also called the inducer, the principal, or the dominant partner, and the secondary partner, also called the associate or submissive partner. Usually the partners are in the same family. This happens about 90% of the time. Obviously in the case of Pauline and Juliet, they were not in the same family. Most primary partners have schizophrenia, delusional disorder, or a major mood disorder with psychosis. So like major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder with psychosis. 
Now, the secondary partner is the one who actually gets diagnosed with folia due when it was available as a diagnosis. But they could also receive other diagnoses like schizophrenia or a major mood disorder. With folia due, the most common types of delusion are mystical and persecutory. It's not often that we see other types like grandiose, somatic, or erotomanic. Essentially, there are four major ways to think about how people end up being delusional in the context of folia due. The first way is referred to as imposed psychosis. One person is psychotic and they transmit the delusions to the other person who did not have any mental disorders beforehand. When the people are separated, the secondary partner no longer suffers from delusions. The second type is communicated psychosis. This is similar to imposed psychosis, but here we see the secondary partner adds delusions on top of what was transmitted. So when the partners are separated, the secondary partner still has some delusions. The third type is simultaneous psychosis. This is where the delusions appear at the same time for both people. So really this is more about two people who have delusions just finding each other than it is about them really influencing each other dramatically. The last type is induced psychosis. Here both people start off as psychotic, but the primary partner introduces new delusional ideas to the secondary partner. Under some conceptualizations of folia due, the last two types don't actually count, because in those definitions, the secondary partner must manifest a delusional belief before coming in contact with the primary partner. So there is some disagreement about what exactly constitutes folia adieu. What really stands out with this construct is how it comes with a significant risk of criminality. Specifically, it's associated with attempted murder and murder, kidnappings, assault, and burglary. Now, looking just at the area of homicide, it's associated with particularly brutal crimes. Not that there is such a thing as polite homicide. There are typically three main motives for homicide in the context of this construct. Defensive, preventing an obstruction of the delusion, and when the partners are threatened with separation. So in the case of Pauline and Juliet, some people believe this is an example of imposed psychosis. They argue Pauline was psychotic and she transmitted her delusions to Juliet. So when they were separated, the delusion stayed in place for Pauline, but they went away in the case of Juliet. This explains why Pauline did not have any remorse initially, and Juliet did. If they did have folia due, then the motive would probably be the fact that they were going to be separated. So this construct does seem to make sense in this case, but as I mentioned, there has been no agreement about any diagnosis in this case. Folia do represents a challenge not only for mental health treatment, but also in the area of criminal justice. It's so rare that it really doesn't occur to people that it could be happening. But when it does happen, unfortunately, it can lead to homicide. Even though this construct is recognized and has been studied, preventing homicides due to folia do is nearly impossible. There's something very powerful specifically about mystical delusions. When people believe that they are special, they can feel justified to do just about anything. In the case of Pauline and Juliet, they believed they were two of only 10 people on the entire planet Earth who could go to this fourth world, as they called it. So you have a situation where the dyad has the ultimate excuse to do just about anything because they are looking for the ultimate reward. They believe they are chosen, they're amazing, and unique. Mystical delusions make people believe that there are no limits to what they deserve. Dealing with people in this situation can be very dangerous. So those are my thoughts on Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.